Thursday morning, it's 9 a.m. That is when the fun begins. It is our town here on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. My name is Darren Swenson. Our town, as always, brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust. A little bit later on in the program, we will get to know new Decora Superintendent Tim Cronin. Uh, he definitely has some family ties to the area, and he will be taking over the Decora School District on July 1st. We'll have a conversation with him. Coming up tonight in West Union, the Iowa Cattlemen's Association will be holding a forum at the West Union Event Center at 5 o'clock. We'll tell you about that forum and how you can sign up and uh, how you can uh, be a little bit more informed with all what's going on uh, in the cattle industry and the uh, cat from the Iowa Cattlemen's Association perspective. We'll talk to Anna Hastert. She is the Director of Communications for the Iowa Cattlemen's Association. But first things first, earlier this week, History was made in Waterloo as for the first time in 45 years, the Cora boys basketball team is heading to the state tournament. Viking boys defeated Clear Lake 46 to 39. It will be the Vikings and DeWitt Central Tuesday afternoon game. You can hear on 104.7 KVIK with Randy and Ryan on the call. But to preview that game, to preview the state tournament, to talk about the year that has been to this point, our first guest on the show this morning is Decorah Boys basketball coach, John Carlson. And that will kick off the Our Town program right now on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. For the first time in 45 years, the Decorah Boys basketball program will be heading to the state tournament. Vikings got there with a 46-39 win over Clear Lake on Monday night. We're with Ed Boys basketball coach, Jonathan Carlson, and I know it's uh, been a process. It's uh, been a length of time. It's always been a goal of the program to uh, end of that uh, long streak without getting to Des Moines. Uh, you're finally there. Uh, what was uh, the feeling like uh, after Monday night's game down at Waterloo East? Well, thanks again, Darren. I appreciate everything that you do and Randy and, and everybody there at uh, Wendis Communications. Um, yeah, I, I was definitely, um, you know, it's kind of one of those that you're you're still kind of, in shock a little bit too, as far as, um, you know, did we actually, did we accomplish that on, on uh, Monday night? But uh, yeah, um, just extremely proud of, proud of all of our guys, uh, all of our coaches, um, you know, just and, and as, and as a program wide uh, as a whole, you know, um, just extremely proud. And, uh, you know, we've had great community support, had a great crowd there uh, uh, Monday night. So it's just a total effort um, from everybody, you know, starting back, um, you know, the DBA years, uh, Coach Storhoff and I, uh, you know, kind of starting that up. And, and that's where it starts is, is your youth programs. And um, we've been blessed with obviously some some good things happening there. And then uh, obviously you got to have some players and and, you know, it's, it's a whole it's a whole community effort. So uh, just just can can say enough good things about everybody. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can keep this thing going. As for the game specifically on uh, Monday night, a 46 to 39 win, uh, maybe a little bit different of a style of a game than uh, you were used to throughout the course of the year. I believe it was your uh, lowest uh, output from a scoring perspective, but it was also uh, one of your lower outputs from a defensive perspective as well. How much confidence does that make, give you uh, moving forward, winning a game that uh, perhaps style-wise you're not used to? Yeah, I think... Uh... I think sub-state games are kind of like that in a sense uh, at times or can be, um, you know, when, when there's a lot on the line. Um, obviously, any any playoff game, you know, you can think of that. But those sub-state games are crazy um, and uh, or can be crazy. And that was definitely what we were in the other night. Uh, you know, each possession, you know, mattered, um, you know, and, and it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a whole, whole lot of room for air with things. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, knowing that we can, we can be in those games, like the last one that we were in kind of like that was, was, was Rushford, um, uh, you know, up at Luther, that was kind of a back and forth, uh, affair there too. I think, you know, that was a one point game. So, you know, take us all the way back to December to be in one of those games where it came down to a couple of possessions. So, um, but yeah, I think it, it definitely prepares us, uh, moving forward to be in one of those games like that. And, uh, hopefully, hopefully it plays, div pays dividends for us. The defensive end of the floor we've talked about uh, before this year has been vitally important to your success. How'd you keep a high powered team like Clear Lake to just 39 points? Well, I want to give our give our coaching staff credit. Uh, they we had we had a you know not myself but uh, you know Coach LaFriends, Coach Rollins, uh, Coach McCain, and Coach Reinhardt. 
um, you know, did a really good job with, with game planning uh, for, for Clear Lake. Um, and we even uh, had Coach Reinhardt strap on the shoes and uh, play play uh, play a role with uh, with the scout at, at times too. So uh, I think that was that actually gave some more guys some juice. They didn't realize that he could he can still ball. So, um, but uh, you know, one of those things where just just a great total team effort defensively. Uh, obviously, Pepo was was huge. Um, you know, his length I think bothered bothered Tavy, kind of warmed down, uh, and then. You know, other guys did a good job on on their other you know other players. Uh, you know, Stortz and and Yelly and and Carson Weimark inside on on Meyer did a great job too. So, I um, mean, we made enough free throws down the stretch to to secure the victory. And you mentioned uh, that Substate game, one of those games where every possession mattered. There wasn't a lot of room for error, and that does create some tension because you still got that dream of getting to a state tournament in a little bit of a, a weird way is it a little bit different of an approach once you get down there next week being the fact that that uh, long streak without a state tournament for the Cora boys basketball uh, is over with now yeah I think you know I think you can look at it a couple different ways obviously we wanted to enjoy it um, but at the same time to understand that you know um, it's not like we're just sneaking in, you know, the back door if so to speak I mean we're, we're 22 and one um, you know it's not like we're you know just like I said, just a team that's happy to get there. I think these guys are hungry. They've had success in other sports, um, you know, had a good football run, a uh, couple guys on cross country, Bennett Schutte there, you know. So they've all been in state state type atmospheres. And, uh, you know, I think obviously it's a, it's a great accomplishment. I don't want to take anything away from that, not being there for 45 years. You don't want to, you know, not be satisfied with that, but also understand that, you know, the old adage of, of state – stay hungry, stay humble, you know, and, uh, you know, I think that's what these guys have done all year and, and they've done a great job with it. And I think that's going to be our, that, that is our approach going down there is, is, you know, don't just be satisfied getting there, you know, uh, let, let's do some damage when they're, when we get there, obviously uh, everybody, when you get to that point is in, you know, obviously Clue Lake was a great team, but anybody down at States can be a great team and uh, you're going to have to play your best, but we like our chances. We like, we like the group that we have. You ended up being the uh, two seed, uh, and you'll uh, play Central DeWitt next Tuesday. Explain to folks how the seeding process works for a state tournament. Yeah, uh, so last year was the first year, um, and, and fortunately I was able to be part of that process last year, being in the Sweet 16, if you will, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, uh, as far as the seeding goes, it, all, so all 16 teams that made the uh, sub-state, you know, there's eight sub-states in, in 3A, so all the eight, eight sub-state uh, participants so 16 teams uh, all those coaches got together on Sunday night where uh, this last Sunday night uh, had three minutes to talk about their team and then after that then you ranked um, the other the other 15 teams not you didn't rank yourself but you ranked so you ranked uh, the other teams one through 15 on on what you thought uh, their record you know wh where they stood uh, obviously one being the best and 15 being the worst so um, I think it's a good process um, you know obviously there's not a very you know, there's not there's not a great way to do any of that. I know that there's you know there's been some issues with two way you know Mid Prairie and Monticello conference teams playing each other, but I think this is the best way to do it. Um, you know, and and gives kind of a you know, and then and then a situation where also we get there's transparency. The the state will send out you know how everybody voted, so there's not really anybody that can you know uh, give somebody a bad seed, so to speak, or, or try to, you know, put themselves up higher or others. And so I think, I think it's an overall good process. What have you been able to uh, transpire about uh, DeWitt Central to this point? Obviously they're still playing, so they're good. Uh, what do you know about them? Well, we know that they have a, uh, they, they have a unique talent. Uh, they have a six, nine uh, post player. Um, so obviously that's something that we haven't seen at all this year. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't seen one of those guys in a long time. I think the last time probably we saw anybody with, you know, six above six, seven, six, eight size was probably Austin Fife uh, at Waverly. Um, and so that'll present some unique challenges. Um, they have some good athletes on the edges. Um, obviously, you know, football, I think, uh, I can't remember, I think you and I maybe called that game back in the day, but I think that was maybe the last time we competed against DeWitt and anything yeah. as far as, um, you know, so there, and if I recall that game, uh, they had some tough nosed kids. Uh, we were lucky. Decor was lucky to win that game in football. I think that might've even been the 12, uh, 12 season. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, just some hard nosed kids, some, some tough nosed kids that they have, uh, obviously the Gilbert kid inside, he's a six, nine kid. Uh, gets a lot of attention. I think he had 45 in their uh, semifinal win over Xavier. Um, but uh, they definitely have some other capable. They didn't give a McEwen kid who was a coach's son. Uh, 
And uh, so they've got some other pieces around them that can hit some shots. So we'll obviously have our hands full, but uh, nothing that I don't, we don't think we can, we can't handle. Big post player inside. You mentioned coach Reinhardt got the shoes on last week. Uh, you're going to get uh, coach LaFrance to put the shoes on this week. <laughs> yeah, he might, uh, he might have to get in there and uh, you know, just, he goes, I don't know if I can get up, up and down any much, much, much anymore, but uh, at least to get in there and give him some size to, to go against with some of that as well. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what he has, see what he has left in the tank. From the itinerary perspective, uh, planning on the trip and staying down there and everything like that, and hopefully it's a full week stay for you guys. Have uh, you guys uh, determined when you're leaving and all those details and uh, already so you can focus on basketball once you get there yeah that's a big thing of this whole process as you know Darren uh, being part of some some of these some of these uh, processes and uh, we, we're lucky we have uh, Mr. Riley uh, there at the high school Adam uh, does a great job with with setting things up with that uh, I actually just had a meeting with him here this morning and uh, yeah we think we have some things ironed out obviously there's some moving moving parts still but uh, I think that's the biggest thing is getting a, getting a plan in place and uh you know, um, given these guys a, a good experience, but also understand that we're down there for business and, uh, you know, it's, it's a business trip. Uh, you know, you want them to enjoy the experience, but the experience is, is, is getting to the state tournament and playing in that arena. So um, that's going to be our full, full focus. And, uh, you know, I think, like I said, we're fortunate to have some, some people in place to help us with that. So I uh, appreciate the, appreciate their support with this, with this process as well. Well, Coach Carlson, congrats on uh, getting to the state tournament and uh, what has been a great season to this point, uh, being 22-1. and one, And hopefully uh, three more games to play uh, for your guys uh, when you get to uh, Des Moines next week. Uh, no team from Winnipeg County has ever won a game at the Boys State Basketball Tournament, and hopefully that streak can end uh, this Monday or this uh, Tuesday afternoon against DeWitt Central. We wish you best of luck, and we appreciate your, the time that uh, you've given us here uh, this afternoon. Hey, we appreciate it, Darren. Thanks again for all your coverage. John Carlson, head coach of the Decora Boys basketball team, Decora and DeWitt Central on Tuesday afternoon at 5.30 at Wells Fargo Arena. The Iowa Cattlemen's Association is holding an event in West Union tonight. And here to tell us about that event is Anna Haftert. She's the Director of Communications for the Iowa Cattlemen's Association. And Anna, tell us uh, what will be uh, going on uh, with your event in West Union tonight. Yeah, so tonight from 5 to 8.30 p.m. at the West Union Event Center, we'll be hosting what is called the West Union Cattle Producer Forum. So this is the third and final cattle producer forum in our series. We held two in different locations earlier this year. Um, but what the cattle producer forums are designed to do is provide both an educational component and a networking component. So um, these events are free and open to the public. So anyone can attend, whether they're a member of the Iowa Cattlemen's Association or not. And um, they will be served a um, complimentary beef meal at the front of the program. Um, but just kind of looking at those educational components that we'll have in the agenda, we'll have a presentation called Setting the Stage with Pre-Breeding Cow Nutrition After a Drought Year. That will be presented by Garland Dahlke of the Iowa Beef Center, just kind of talking about how you get your um, mother cows in great condition for um, breeding season, especially after last year's drought across the state. Um, then you'll also hear from an ICA staff member about what work we've been doing on the policy front, both here at the state and federal level. Um, and the Iowa Beef Industry Council will also be in attendance. They'll talk about some of the successes that they've seen with the Iowa Beef Checkoff within the past year. And then to wrap things up, we'll have a presentation from Lance Zimmerman of Cattle Facts. And he's going to give a um, marketing update, kind of talk about where the cattle markets are headed throughout 2022 and the importance of separating emotions from markets and how that can make you a better marketer in the long run. Is this something that the Cattlemen's Association uh, does uh, pretty much every year? Yeah, so this is one of the events that we host annually, usually towards the earlier part of the year. Um, and then during the summer months, usually in June, we host what are called beef meets. And um, those are held both on farm and off farm. And that's another opportunity for us to meet with producers to get grassroots input. But yeah, um, our cattle producer forums are just a great way to connect with our membership at the beginning of the year talk about what we're doing on the policy front, and also just get them prepared for a successful year ahead. 
And is it a two-way conversation? Not only do you guys provide the uh, great information to producers, but do you get feedback from producers on what their concerns are uh, about the current situation and on ways to improve uh, the market as uh, well as possible? Yeah, absolutely. So after um, ICA provides its policy update, we'll open the floor for uh, questions and discussion and just to kind of hear from producers their concerns about what's happening across the countryside today and um, maybe some things that we can take action on moving forward. And then again, we encourage folks to join us again in June for our beef meets. That's really where we get to into the thick of the policy discussions and um, provide more dedicated time for producers to provide that grassroots input um, that that helps us move forward and um, on the policy front. And this may seem like a silly question. It's really not intended to be, but uh, the cattle industry, how important is that to the economy of the state of Iowa? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's absolutely important, Darren, and um, our producers are working day in and day out to um, help put beef on the plates of consumers and, um, and, and, you know, make a profit at the end of the day doing that as well. So um, we're really looking forward to having those conversations with our producers to learn how we can better support them moving forward so that they can support um, the thousands of Americans that rely on them day in and day out. Is there any uh, pre-registration required for this event? Pre-registration is not required, but it is encouraged, and you can do so by giving us a call here at the office. Our number is 515-296-2266. Uh, Walk-ins are welcome, so if you're just not sure what your plans might be for this evening up until the last minute, um, we still encourage you to attend if you feel so inclined. All right, Dana, give us the uh, final who, what, where, when, and why about uh, tonight's events in West Union. Absolutely. So the West Union Cattle Producer Forum hosted by the Iowa Cattlemen's Association will be held this evening from 5 to 8.30 p.m. at the West Union Event Center. Um, we'll kick things off at 5 o'clock with dinner and registration and um, have educational presentations throughout. There will also be opportunities for you to network with cattle producers in the area, as well as some of the trade show vendors that will be present. Um, but again, RSVPs are encouraged by calling 515-296-2266, and walk-ins are always welcome. All right, Anna, we appreciate you taking some time to tell us about this uh, important event coming up in uh, West Union tonight. Uh, we thank you for the time, as always, and hopefully it's a uh, great year for the cattle industry in the state of Iowa. Thanks, Darren. Anna Haster, she is the Director of Communications for the Iowa Cattlemen's Association, the forum tonight at the West Union Event Center beginning at 5 p.m. Just a few weeks ago, the Decorah Community School District announced its new superintendent and here joining us this morning and having a conversation with us is Tim Cronin, uh, who will be uh, joining the district officially on July 1st of this year. And uh, Tim, uh, Based on your family ties, you might not have ever lived in Decorah, but do you feel like you're coming home a little bit? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, I think back to there's some folks, we lived in Wisconsin uh, right after we got married. And I think there's some folks that think I did grow up in, in, in Decorah because we'd always be going to the farm. And my, my, we grew up, I grew up in Iowa City, but my folks moved to Wisconsin when I was in college. So all of a sudden I didn't have a hometown. So. I guess I adopted the core as the, as the hometown. So, but yeah, absolutely. With my four years at Luther and with us still having a family farm in the area, uh, it's, it's an area that, that we're somewhat familiar with uh, on the fun side with all the outside activities and places to eat and stuff like that. So yeah, and just the number of people I know from Luther College or, or maybe relatives or people that want to, uh, uh, that I know that way. I even ran into a, one or two people from Iowa City that live up in Decorah. So, and, good job. and was this a position uh, with your connections to the community that uh, if it ever came open, uh, you were going to take a look at it if everything else uh, fit in uh, when it came to uh, family and uh, life and everything like that? Oh, 100 percent. 100 percent. This was uh, I, you know, there's probably a, there's different jobs that I've had and communities I've worked in that I've really enjoyed. But uh, Decorah was uh, on a list, a pretty small list of one or two places that that I would want to work. And, and so uh, I was thrilled when it came open and got to participate in the process. And uh, when I, I, at the interview, I might mentioned that it was my dream job and, and uh, uh, that's absolutely hundred percent true. 
tell us about your uh, educational career. Uh, take us through uh, the time uh, from when you left uh, Luther College to uh, when you're coming back to town now. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I, I start with, I usually tell folks that uh, I grew up in a family of educators. Uh, we, uh, it's either, you know, it was either uh, educators or farmers or folks that moved into the family. Uh, at reunions and stuff. So uh, yeah, I grew up in Iowa City. Uh, my folks were both, uh, my dad was actually the superintendent of Iowa City and my mom worked with the University of Iowa in education. I did my undergrad at Luther, uh, switched over to elementary education my first year. Uh, my first uh, teaching job after graduating from Luther was for the Linmar School District. Um, and I was there five years and I was starting my sixth year um, and I had my administrative license in Marshalltown, Iowa, uh, needed an needed a interim principal. Their principal had left like September 1st. So uh, my first uh, principalship was a one-year interim principalship in Marshalltown, Iowa at Anson Elementary. Um, and then uh, in the spring of that year, I started looking around and uh, um, I think there, there was an opportunity to stay in Marshalltown. And at the same time, I applied uh, in a, uh, Beloit, Wisconsin. And so I uh, went through the process, got hired as an elementary principal in Beloit. Um, and uh, so I was in Beloit for four years. Uh, I suppose I should back up just a little bit and say, when I first started dating my wife, we were about half an hour apart. She was in Iowa City and I was in Marion. And then I moved to uh, uh, Marshalltown and we were uh, uh, an hour and a half apart. And then I moved to Beloit and we were three hours apart. And so at some point in there, we both decided she was like, you can't move any farther away from me. <laughs> so, uh, so we got married after my first year of being a principal um, and actually out of Big Canoe, which is a different story. Uh, but we had some folks in Wisconsin that were driving around pretty lost on, uh, 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 oh, what would that be, Locust Road, trying to find Big Canoe Church. Uh, anyway, so I, I had 10 years of being an elementary principal in Wisconsin with two different districts. I was with Beloit and I was with Greenfield in the Milwaukee area. Uh, we moved back to Iowa. I was a principal at uh, in Cedar Rapids at Kenwood Elementary. Uh, at that time, I also went and got my uh, finished off my superintendent certification and got my PhD um, and applied and got the uh, superintendency at uh, Central City back in 2013. And three years ago, uh, we entered into a sharing agreement where I shared with Dunkerton uh, about a 50-50 share. For the last three years, I've been at Central City and at Dunkerton. So, yeah, so that a very uh, diverse uh, background uh, with many different districts, many different experience. Uh, how does do you feel that helps you uh, lead a school district, knowing the fact that you've uh, seen education from a variety of perspectives? That certainly is is true. There, they, you know, each district has a different flair, and you know, I've worked uh, maybe. Uh, and a little bit more diverse or a little bit more uh, 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 higher demographics, uh, maybe with free reduced lunch and stuff. I think at the, at, so different experiences. I, I tell people the last three years where I've been shared superintendent has really been a good uh, growth experience for me with Central City and Dunkerton, just because I got to see how another superintendent, how, how that structure works in another district. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, uh, a lot of that stuff, whatever the makeup of the district or, or what state you're in, it's just, uh, you know, it's based on building relationships with folks and, you know, being a good listener and making sound decisions. And I, you know, that I think uh, I've been able to, for the most part, do in the districts I've worked in. And, and that's what I look forward to doing in Decorah. You mentioned Decorah was always kind of on your radar screen. What made this the right time to pursue this job? Oh, because, uh, <laughs> uh uh, it, it was open. Uh, that was, that, you, you hate to pursue a job that's, that's already filled. Uh, no, we're getting, we're getting, uh, 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 I guess, to a point in our life where we're starting to at least having the discussion about retirement. I'm certainly about eight to 10 years away from retiring, but kind of setting up and uh, um, uh, my folks are getting older. I, I think I mentioned the family farm. They spend about uh, oh, at least 30% of the time out there. So being, being able to be around for them will be a nice thing as well. And uh, uh, yeah, it just fit. I, I could probably tell you that lots of different times in my life would have been a good time for this job to come open, but this one really uh, fits out well, uh, fits out well just kind of with uh, 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 moving forward with kind of getting settled into community. Because um, I really, I mentioned a few times in my interview process that 
it's kind of always been my desire to retire uh, in the Decorah area, obviously with land and, and some relatives up there, it's pretty familiar for us. So this kind of gives us a little bit of a head start on that process. From the outside looking in and what you were able to surmise through the interview process, uh, what makes the Decorah School District a special one? What made it an attractive opening uh, for the candidates uh, that ended up being finalists and ultimately chosen by you? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I think uh, it's certainly a high-performing school district, uh, you know, uh, in the classroom and, and on, the, uh, uh, on the fields of uh, athletic competition. Uh, lots of great community support. Um, you know, the, uh, as a superintendent, I'll tell you this, when you meet the board and they've all been on the board 10 years or plus, uh, that's always a good sign too, just from a, from a superintendent's perspective. You don't want to go to a district where, you know, they're changing over board members every, you know, four years. So, so a lot of stability is nice in a district, but uh, um, yeah, I, folks, when, when I got the job, my, my superintendent uh, peers, um, you know, I, it's, yeah, the comment that was made to me was, uh, gosh, that's, that's one of the top five 3A districts in the state. And I said, well, I don't know who the other four are, but it's, it certainly is, uh, uh, in my mind, one of the top districts. Just There's a lot of positive things, a lot of good vibes about Decora and, um, and the stuff, you're, uh, stuff that, that we, they've been able to do. And, and like I said, community support, board support, that always helps because you want to have that, you know, that helps you with staff retention and staff morale and stuff like that when, when, a, when an administrative team has that going for it. You've transitioned to uh, various different positions throughout your educational uh, career. Uh, what is key as you enter a new position in kind of getting the lay, of the, line, the lay of the land of a, a new school district and uh, getting your feet wet, if you will? Yeah, I think it's real important, uh, and I've kind of learned this in Central City, is to come in and make sure you're a good listener and take notes and look for themes uh, in, you know, because you might talk to 10 people and they might have 10 different opinions, but if you start re, you know, hearing uh, over and over different themes uh, that come up, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, facilities or maybe it's a certain part of the program or uh, whether it be athletics or academics, uh, when you see those patterns, that's where you start to make your plans. Um, I would say, I, I, and I mentioned this as I went through the process, um, a quote, uh, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't tear up a fence until you understand why it was installed. Um, and uh, that's a nice little farm type quote. It's actually, I think it's called Schrodinger's fence, but is, is what the theory is. But the idea is you got to come in and understand. And I think that's one of the things I learned uh, when I went to Central City. I was pretty worried that I you know, wanted to make a great impression and I wanted everybody to to know how smart I was, or at least how smart I thought I was, and maybe I talked a little too much. And uh, so kind of looking back on that experience, not that it was bad, but just like, hey, make sure you listen first. You don't have all the answers. You, I certainly don't know exactly how Decor has been doing stuff. So I wanna get in and make sure I understand before I start proposing a whole bunch of different changes, uh, if that would be what I would do. So, so transitioning in is, I'd say listening, uh, and talking to as many different people as you can and looking for different subgroups of folks. You know, don't always just talk to, you know, maybe the administrative team. Make sure you're talking to teachers. Make sure you're talking to uh, all sorts of certified and classified staff and community members. So um, I, I started a little bit of that, got some of those meetings scheduled with board members. Obviously, I don't start until July 1, but that'll be my goal is to come in and make sure I understand the district and, and its needs um, as we move forward. So in other words, the big guy gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't need to. I don't need to talk all the time. Obviously, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, listen to other people. Um, I, I like uh, like differing opinions and making sure that we uh, have a you know healthy debate when we're making decisions on stuff. Based on uh, what you've uh, surmised to this point, what's the biggest uh, short term challenge? For uh, the Decorah School District, uh, what's perhaps the biggest long-term challenge as it sits presently? Uh, so I'm a little reluctant to say that exactly. I'd say in general in education, I think we're uh, uh, we're fighting uh, teacher retention, uh, well, staff retention. Um, we don't have as many candidates for positions as we are. So among other things, short-term, we need to hire a high school principal. And I know that that process is going to happen. Uh, 
hopefully uh, I talked a little bit uh, with uh, the board president, Ron, and then Mark uh, Lane about that process. And I think uh, we're gonna get that vetted. So that's probably, that's easy to say, that's the, the number one. Um, maybe longer term is, is uh, came up a lot was just the elementary facilities and what the, what the plan is with that. And I don't know all of those. I know that there's been discussions about that. So that's, uh, that would be something that we'd wanna look at addressing. But yeah, just in general, uh, education's facing challenges with staffing issues and, you know, declining enrollment. And so making sure you're viable and you're able to provide a, uh, good educational opportunities for students are our biggest challenge. And I know with the declining enrollment, uh, situation, uh, when you talk about like state allowable growth, uh, schools with declining enrollment, that means less money coming in. Do you feel it's time that the state of Iowa looks at the funding formula for education moving forward to uh, maybe uh, take a different gander? Because that formula, I'm 45 years old, that formula is older than me. Is it time to take a look, being the fact that education is uh, changing? Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, I'll say this, uh, it's in an era when, we, you know, we've got the consumer price index is going up. Um and, uh, you know, if when they redid the collective bargaining agreement a couple of years ago, they, they said that there's a, a I'm going to get the term wrong. Uh, if, if, if a teacher's association and a school board can't agree, then you, then you settle on the smaller amount of percentage of 3% or consumer price index. And when they passed that law, consumer price index was around 1%. So, you know, Worst case scenario, districts do, okay, we have to commit to 1% um, uh, compensation package. Now, uh, I don't know if you looked it up, you probably don't look up consumer price index and I haven't looked it up for a while, but it's up to about, it's up to about 8% now. And so the problem is, so that means the, 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 uh, the floor for settling is now 3% and we just got 2.5 2 from the state. So when all our costs go up, and uh, districts need to settle at a 3% or higher for the most part, it's tough to get 2.5% new money. And then that's, that's magnified when you have declining enrollment. And it's not that we don't, you know, and then of course, and, and I'm not saying settle like it's a bad thing, you know, we want to try to pay teachers as much as we can. Mm. We just want to make sure we pay them as much as we can and make sure that we don't, you know, spend all the money the district has and then we're not viable that way. So we're, the school districts all over the state are in a tough spot with, with 2.5%, uh, with knowing that settlements have to be over 3%, and then just in general wanting to retain staff members because uh, we need to increase salaries regardless in most places throughout the state just to, to keep people that, uh, uh, you know, doing a job that is vital to a community. So, yeah, when you ask me on how the funding formula should be, uh, it's just tough to, to settle under 3%. You know, when I first started, we were settling some years 4%, and it was just it was much more manageable to do that with, with budgets and knowing the costs were going up because there's, there's no costs that are going down in school districts. That's for sure. Uh, and I think we all see that in, in, you know, grocery stores and gas stations and stuff like that. So it's kind of a tough spot. And I know uh, between now and July, uh, you've got uh, your own job to take care of uh, presently uh, running a uh, central city in the uh, Dunkerton school district. Uh, but I understand uh, you're going to be uh, as involved as you possibly can uh, doing uh, stuff to get ready for uh, July 1st. Uh, how uh, often are you going to make your way up to uh, Decorah over the uh, next few months? Uh, the, the plan, the schedule plan is, is one time a month uh, to maybe try to get to town and, and talk to some folks. Um, we were up on Sunday just kind of looking at different housing options because uh, I don't know if <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of the, the housing market. Uh, uh, we're getting emails and texts from folks who either knew we're looking and the house might be for sale. So we did a little bit of that on Sunday, but um, so one time a month, but kind of looking at my schedule, I might sneak up a little bit more. Days I work in Dunker time, I'm an hour closer. So that's a little bit easier to do, but I'll be coming up. Uh, I think I'm scheduled to be up, uh, 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 start of our uh, spring break is, is like March 15th. So I'm gonna sneak up there, but I am gonna try to sneak out on Tuesday. I think I can get Des Moines by 5.30 on Tuesday and and support the, the, the Viking ba boys basketball team as they play in the state tournament for the first time since 1977. 
Yeah, I was eight months old the last time uh, they played down there. You, how much red and blue you got in your wardrobe right now, Tim? Uh, it, it, I, I'm gaining. I'm gaining some stuff. In <laughs> fact, I, I just uh, I bought my state uh, tournament teacher. I bought one for myself and one for my son who lives in Des Moines. He said he'd go to the game with me. So hopefully I can figure out how to pick those up and have those at the game on uh, Tuesday night. But All yeah, right. so your original question, at least one time a month and, you know, just kind of uh, see how schedules go. And I've been working with board members on when I can sit down because that's where I want to start my conversations and I'll work up to admin teams and, and stuff like that. All right, Tim, we appreciate uh, you joining us and uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, the transition you'll make to the Decorah School District uh, here in July. And, oh, by the way, sorry for not following you back on Twitter uh, when you followed me seven years ago. I'm <laughs> Hopefully I've uh, sent a, a better impression uh, than I did uh, via social media on that end of things. Uh, Tim, uh, congrats on the new position. Uh, congrats on uh, getting to come home, if you will. And I look forward to uh, working with you once you get going on July 1st. Sounds very good. Thanks so much. Tim Cronin, the new Decorah superintendent. He'll start his work in the Decorah Community School District on July 1st. Big thank you to our guest on the program, Decorah Boys basketball coach John Carlson. It'll be the Vikings and DeWitt Central in the first round of the state tournament on Tuesday afternoon at 5.30 here at on 104.7 KVIK. Randy and Ryan will have the call. Randy got to become the first uh, Decorah radio announcer since the legendary Ken Bierke to call a Decorah Boys trip to state. He did that 45 years ago. I was eight months old at the time. Uh, they didn't let me in the booth for some reason at that time. Best of luck to the Viking boys on uh, their trip to Des Moines uh, this week. We also want to thank Anna Hastert from the uh, Iowa Cattlemen's Association, the Iowa Cattlemen's Association Forum at the West Union Event Center tonight. At 5 o'clock, they will take some walk-ins, but uh, pre-registration is a uh, Requested, I guess, uh, is the best way to put it, uh, by calling the Iowa Cattlemen's Association, and their number is listed on the website. And it was fun to get to know a uh, new Decorah School Superintendent, uh, Tim Cronin. Uh, Tim with uh, definitely some family ties to this area, and he's coming back home, if you will. He will take over for Mark Lane as Decorah School Superintendent on July 1st of this year. Don't forget, we put these shows out on YouTube each and every week. So you can see the interesting people we get to talk to on a weekend and week out basis. Basically, uh, for today's show, go 3 slash 3 Our Town Program. Search that on YouTube. You can watch the show there. We also put it out on our Facebook pages on all of the LA Communications radio stations as well. So uh, if we were understand, you can't be uh, by the radio at 9 o'clock or by your favorite streaming device at 9 o'clock on a Thursday morning. We allow you to watch this show on demand. The Our Town is available on our YouTube channel. Our thanks to our sponsor, Decorah Bank and Trust. Our thanks to our guests. And most importantly, we thank you for tuning in, for logging on, or for watching Our Town on 94.9 and 99.1 The River.